Welcome to the National Museum of Military Vehicles. My name is Dan Starks. I'm the chairman and founder of the museum. The reason my wife and I created this museum is two primary purposes. The first is to do our part to honor the service and sacrifice of veterans and their families. The second is to educate next generations on the history of American freedom. No matter who you are, no matter what your background is, no matter what your politics are, one of the goals is to have you see something of yourself in the history of American freedom that we're remembering in the museum. And how are we going to do that unless we really know what the stories are and what did people do in their service? So this is a collection of stories. This isn't about the vehicles at all. This is about the stories. If we want people to appreciate what uh, forefathers have done, what people have done before them, they need to know something about it. It's the next generation that has to step up. They have to know what does it take to create and then sustain our standard of living, our level of freedom. And so we've got this sign here on the wall, originally uh, expressed in Latin by Romans, talking about, if you want peace, prepare for war. That's an eternal truth. We don't get peace by being peaceful. We need to be prepared to meet conflict if it's thrust upon us, and that's how we have the best chance of preserving peace. I'm primarily gonna to tour everybody through our World War II gallery, the General George C. Marshall Gallery. Uh, but before I do that, I wanna just talk a little bit about the richness of the museum. Everything that you see is here for a reason, and it's here because it's meaningful. There's a story behind it. What you see behind me is the most famous firearm in the history of American freedom. This is the John Simpson Bunker Hill musket. This is the musket that fired the very first shot at the very first battle between the Continental Army and the British Army in June of 1775. John Simpson brought his personal firearm from home to confront tyranny. This really remembers why do we have a Second Amendment. This also really marks first shot first major battle, the very founding of the United States of America, all here in this musket. There's a lot of other firearms here. Uh, I'll point out a, a German machine gun, an MG42. It's really an iconic, famous firearm. It was the fastest firing machine gun of any military during World War II. It fired 1,200 rounds a minute, and it was nicknamed Hitler's buzzsaw. I'm pointing that out because when we get into the World War II gallery, I'm gonna to refer to the German MG42. Now let's move into highlights of the Marshall Gallery to talk about the American experience during World War II. We've named the World War II Gallery after General Marshall to make sure that his contributions to the history of American freedom are not forgotten. General Marshall was the head of the Army during World War II. He was General Eisenhower's boss. He was the architect of the famous Marshall Plan to reconstruct Europe after World War II ended. So let me start with why do we begin the World War II gallery talking about amphibious landings? The reason we do that is every major campaign, American campaign during World War II, started with an amphibious landing. If you think back to World War I, the American Expeditionary Force traveled over to Europe on civilian ocean liners and disembarked at friendly French ports, just like it was peacetime condition. But by the time the United States entered World War II, every bit of land occupied by Imperial Japan, every bit of land that had been uh, conquered by Nazi Germany, was defended to the waterline. We had to figure out for the first time, how are we gonna get from an ocean-going troop ship to a beach 
in combat conditions. So what you see here in the World War II gallery is the series of innovations that we created along with the tactics that we had to invent to make successful amphibious combat assaults. The most famous amphibious assault craft was the Higgins boat invented by Andrew Higgins. President Eisenhower, after World War II, credited Andrew Higgins with winning the war for us. That's an exaggeration, but it really underscores the importance of the invention of the Higgins boat. The Higgins boat is a very shallow draft boat. It can motor in less than three feet of water. It was used for oil and gas exploration. It was used to run uh, bootleg liquor. The military is aware that it has a capability of operating in very shallow water. So the military goes to Higgins and they ask him to put a ramp on the bow so that the bow can drop down and troops can offload quickly. The boat itself, you know, it had modifications, but it was made mostly out of plywood. So machine gun bullets go right through it. So imagine what it was like to actually conduct a combat assault in a Higgins boat. We've got 36 troops packed in, shoulder to shoulder, chest to back. The first hazard that troops would have is the Germans would zero in on the Higgins boats with those MG42s. And the Germans know, well, that ramp's got to come down. And as soon as it comes down, I'll just start pouring 1,200 rounds a minute into that narrow opening. It was not unusual for everybody in the boat to be massacred before they could engage in combat. So just think about your alternatives. The people in front of you are getting mowed down by machine gun fire. What are you gonna do? Either you wait for the machine gun fire to hit you or you get out of the boat any way you can. An option was see if you could scramble over the side. If you scramble over the side, you might drown. Now water's deeper back there. A second example, a second strategy, we've got first-hand accounts. We had one of our guests came through here in August her husband had passed. He assaulted Omaha Beach in a Higgins boat. His experience was the people in front of him were getting hit by machine gun fire. He grabbed the body of the buddy in front of him and held it up as a shield and got out. Can you imagine people coming back from combat and saying, I don't want to talk about it. Those are the kinds of experiences people had. Those are the kinds of choices people had to make. I wanna talk about the debacle of Higgins boats at the Battle of Tarawa. So this is November of 1943. We'd already had uh, several successful amphibious landings. Uh, three landings in North Africa had been successful, relatively uneventful. We'd had a successful amphibious landing at Guadalcanal. But here at Tarawa, this is the first time that we're going into the teeth of the lion. So we've got hundreds of Higgins boats motoring from the transports toward the beach and the command failed to take into account the impact of the coral reef that surrounded Tarawa. The Higgins boats get to the reef and they all stop. They're all ground out on the reef. They're all stuck and hung up. Between the coral reef and the beach, you've got a lagoon. So that lagoon starts out being deep-ish, over your head or up to your neck. And then you've got 500 yards with no cover that's not what they signed up for. They're all prepped. They're gonna get taken right into shallow water. Instead, the ramps drop on all these Higgins boats 500 yards out, and the Marines are ordered to go into deep water, full combat gear. And they all did it. Our men wade ashore from wrecked amphibians. Casualties are pretty high. It takes a heavy toll of our boats and men. It doesn't stop us. Up to 70% of some of the marine companies were killed wading through that water, just working to get to the beach. This is the price we have to pay for a war we didn't want. And before it's over, there'll be more dead on other battlefields. After Tarawa, we were more careful about assessing the presence and impact of a coral reef and if we uh, needed to cross a coral reef, we didn't use a Higgins boat. We used the amphibious tractor or the LVT, landing vehicle track. This was the solution to the limitations of the Higgins boat where a uh, combat assault had to pass over a coral reef. So the Higgins boat couldn't do it, the amphibious tractor could. These two together were the workhorses and the primary solutions in response to this need to innovate how in the world are we gonna do an amphibious combat assault.
So as we exit the amphibious landing gallery, we're gonna walk past airborne operations. The reason that we include airborne operations as part of the amphibious landing gallery is because remember I said we had to not only innovate the vessels, but we also had to innovate the tactics that we used for amphibious assaults. And airborne operations was part of the tactics that we devised to make it more likely that an amphibious landing would be successful. Think about being a paratrooper. You're volunteering to put yourself where you're gonna be surrounded by a superior number of enemy. You're trying to create confusion. You're trying to take some of the pressure off of the assault troops. And you're willing to sacrifice your life to do it, to save lives of these people you don't even know. This is what people did to give all of us what we've got. This is the kind of thing we're gonna to have to keep doing or we're gonna lose what we got. That's what this museum's about. So I've hit the highlights of the amphibious landing stories. There's lots more to tell, but let's move on to the next uh, diorama. And I'd like to talk about the early American uh, combat experience on the ground in World War II. One example of uh, Americans fighting the Japanese, one example of Americans fighting the Germans. We have witnessed this morning the distant view most Americans have heard of the Battle of Pearl Harbor, the Japanese surprise attack on the American fleet on December 7, 1941. Most Americans are not aware of what happened beginning December 8th. That's the day that the first Battle of the Philippines started. The Philippines were U.S. territory in 1941 as a result of the Spanish-American War in 1898. So we had a collaboration. We had a Philippine Civil Administration. We had a combined Philippine and U.S. force administering to the Philippines with the idea that this was a transition period and the Philippines would become independent in 1946. But we're still in 1941. General MacArthur was the commander of the combined Philippine-U.S. force. He had close to 100,000 infantry. He had his own air force. He had strong naval support. On December 7, MacArthur receives a radio message from, from Pearl Harbor indicating the Japanese have attacked, the war has started, you're next, get ready. And above all, don't let your Air Force get caught on the ground. Nine hours after General MacArthur received that message, most of his Air Force was destroyed on the ground at Clark Airfield. The Navy suffered enough losses at Pearl Harbor that it made the tough decision that it had to conserve its remaining strength. It had to repair the facilities that had been damaged in the attack on Pearl Harbor. It needed to raise as many salvageable ships from the bottom of Pearl Harbor as possible. It needed to reinforce, regroup before it engaged what now was a superior Japanese Navy. That meant that MacArthur's force in the Philippines was isolated, cut off, no reinforcements, no evacuation, no resupply of ammunition, food, or medical supplies. And that then marked the beginning of the First Battle of the Philippines. That battle lasted four months. During that four months, MacArthur and his headquarters staff isolate themselves on the island of Corregidor. The rest of the U.S. Philippine military withdraws into the peninsula of Bataan, they're prepared to engage in mountainous jungle warfare to resist the Japanese, to try to buy time. The United States did not want Japan to get the propaganda victory of capturing General MacArthur. So MacArthur is ordered to personally evacuate with his wife, with his direct staff. He gets on a PT boat, goes to another part of the Philippines, and then takes an aircraft to Australia. He tells the forces he leaves behind, don't surrender. Hold out as long as you can. Time and fate in the form of a victory-swollen Japanese war machine were inexorable. Manila fell. 
Batan was driven to her knees. The Allied forces fought that four months until they were completely worn out. They were starving. A lot of them were uh, sick with jungle diseases. They're running out of ammunition. And on April 9th, 1942, the commander of the Bataan forces, General King, surrendered. He surrendered 75,000 troops. That's the largest surrender in American history. So the Japanese are still fighting the holdouts on the island of Corregidor. The Japanese round up the 75,000 POWs and march them off the peninsula of Bataan to POW camps. That march took three to four days. During that 60 to 70 mile march, 10,000 of those 75,000 prisoners died. That's the Bataan death march. Men died. And those few who lived through the infamous death march became the walking ghosts of Bataan. We were in Marvellous when that march started. It was hot and San Fernando was 90 kilometers away. We had to do away with our stuff and carry theirs. Machine guns and ammo cases. No food and water. Our guys were dropping like flies. It took five days to get to San Fernando. When we got there, God knows how, they shoved us into boxcars and slammed the doors. Four hours, stinking, dirty filth, and jammed in like sardines. But that march, I cannot forget it. Even the three years after, in the prison camps, bad as they were, it was that march that still gives me nightmares. So that's how our fight against Japan started. Four months of ground combat, largest surrender in American history. Now let's talk about how the fighting went when we first engaged the Germans uh, beginning in November of 1942. To talk about the American experience fighting the Germans at the Battle of Kazarine Pass, I wanna start with the backdrop of what was the condition of the American military leading up to World War II. In 1917, before most of you fighting men were born, our fathers fought the first world war to make the world safe for democracy, for the common man. They fought a good fight and won it. There was to be no more war in their time or their children's time. Faithful to our treaty obligations, we destroyed much of our naval tonnage. Our army went on a reducing diet until it became little more than a skeleton. For us, war was to be outlawed. For us, Europe was far away. After World War I, the United States returned to a condition of isolationism where, unless you attack us on our homeland, it's not our business as a matter of national security. So we're not getting involved in another European war. We did not maintain a large standing army. Secondly, we entered the Great Depression. A large part of the American economy evaporated. A lot of American wealth disappeared. The remaining economy and wealth were prioritized to domestic concerns, not to supporting a standing army, and certainly not to upgrading weapon systems. When war broke out, we started to rebuild. We eventually built to a military that had more than 12 million people. Think about the math and what that math means. If we have a professional military of less than 400,000 and we build to a military of more than 12 million, we don't have much experience to go around. Almost everybody is new. They're fresh out of civilian life. They've been to boot camp. They don't have any military experience. They're not professional soldiers. They don't have any combat experience, and that would include the troops. It'd include non-commissioned officers. It would include junior officers, and it would mean that the professional junior officers got promoted with less experience to become senior officers. And that then is the military that we drew from to invade North Africa beginning November of 1942. Now think about who we were fighting. 
were fighting Rommel's battle-hardened troops. His troops have been in combat since 1939. The first major engagement between our inexperienced military and the battle-hardened German troops took place early in 1943 in the area of Kazarine Pass, and we were severely defeated. Tunisia was gray with German troops, 15 full divisions. No scratch troops these, but battle-wise veterans of Poland, France, the Balkans. They, together with seven Italian divisions, were armed with the most modern types of equipment, including the newest fighters and bombers of the German Luftwaffe. The German orders were, hold Tunisia at all costs, keep control of the Mediterranean. Rommel, standing behind his Marath line, saw that he must soon be faced with an attack in the rear from the Allied armies along the Great Dorsal, as well as an assault by the 8th Army at Marath. He therefore struck first, in an endeavor to remove the menace behind him. On February the 14th, the blow was struck. Heavy armored columns burst out of Fayyid Pass in the mountain barrier and threw into the valley beyond. In the face of their onslaught, Allied armor withdrew with heavy losses. By the 21st, the enemy had forced his way through the Kasserine Pass and his armored columns were advancing in a three-pronged thrust. Our troops didn't know how deep to dig foxholes. They were crushed by German armor. Our leadership did not have effective tactics. We did not fight in a coordinated fashion. We were lured into a valley with old and obsolete weapon systems, into a trap where the Germans had the high ground saturated with 88 millimeter guns. In that 10 day fight in the area of Kazarine Pass, we lost 183 tanks. We lost lots more artillery. We lost other armored equipment. We suffered 7,000 casualties, and we retreated back toward Morocco. So let me say a little bit about what we were fighting with at the Battle of Kazarine Pass. So we were fighting with the predecessor to the Sherman tank, the M3 tank. You see, a, you see it here. Look at what's wrong with this tank. Look at the main gun on the tank. It's a short, small gun. Short is a clue. This is a low velocity gun. Look what we were fighting against. I talked about the German 88 millimeter guns being on the high ground. Here's the German 88, long, high velocity, bigger shell, very effective tank killer. Look at what else is wrong with the M3 tank. The main gun, not only is it undersized, but look, it's not even in a turret. It's set in the hull. If you wanna aim it, you need to move your tank. How's that for a disadvantage in combat? Look what else is wrong with this tank. Look at the armor is held together by rivets. You won't see another American tank later in the war where the armor is held together by rivets. The rivets were cheaper and easier to use for manufacturing rather than casting a hull or rather than welding the hull. The problem was if a German shell hit the outside of the tank and the armor held up to the impact of the shell so the crew should be safe, right? But the impact, the jarring impact of that shell would often break the rivets off inside the fighting chamber and send the rivets through the fighting chamber like shrapnel and kill everybody even though the armor held up. So that's just an example of what I'm talking about with old or obsolete weapon systems and then having such an inexperienced military. Our first fight against Japan, we're defeated, our entire army surrenders. Our first fight against the Germans, we're defeated, we're sent fleeing in retreat. Let's move around the corner and talk about what is it that we had going for us to help offset the disadvantages of having such a small and such an inexperienced and such a poorly armed military when World War II broke out. 
One of the lessons we learned in World War I is that we were severely handicapped by our inability to use the strength of our economy to support our war effort. When we sent the American Expeditionary Force over to Europe, we actually had to arm our troops with French and British supplies. Lieutenant Dwight Eisenhower was one of the key people in creating the economic mobilization plans between World War I and World War II. And in World War II then, one of the major reasons that we were able to overcome all those disadvantages we had with a small, inexperienced, poorly equipped military was we had the largest economy in the world and we were ready to mobilize it. And we did. In this factory, as in so many others in America, the people did something which tripped up the thinking of the enemy. The enemy knew we were manufacturers. They knew we had men. But they didn't know we could change our way of life enough to give our men the tools of war in overpowering quantity. This was the time of victory gardens. Everyone's encouraged, grow as much of your own food as you can at home because we've got to send food overseas to support the troops. This was the time of national scrap drives. We've got to get all of the steel that is lying around in junkyards or lying around wherever it is. We've got to melt it down and we've got to turn it into ships or aircraft or tanks or other uh, military equipment. This was the time of rationing fuel, the time of rationing food. This was everybody affected by the need to change the normal things we would do in life, to do without everything except necessities and devote absolutely everything to overcoming uh, Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. An example of this is there's no such thing as a 1942, a 1943, or a 1944 American civilian car. Every bit of steel, every bit of rubber, the manufacturing capacity that could have been allocated for civilian products like that was all converted to creating war material. So what we're showing in this part of the museum is just a diorama to introduce the topic of the impact our manufacturing economy had on our military success. And you see this quote from uh, uh, President Roosevelt. So this is within the first 30 days after Pearl Harbor. He's not talking about uh, we need more troops. He's not talking about we need to improve our training. He's directing the attention of the American people to this truth that the way we're going to win is with overwhelming production, crushing superiority of equipment. And with that, I'd like to move into the combat vehicles rotunda and talk about some of the products that came out of this total mobilization of the American economy to support the war effort. The highlight of this rotunda is here we have an example of every major ground combat vehicle that the United States produced during World War II. This is a small part of what came from our economic strength. Do you see a good example of what it meant to say that we had an advantage in innovation in our manufacturing economy as well as in the size of our manufacturing economy? So look at these half tracks. These really represent six different weapon systems. We have a mortar carrier. We have a self-propelled assault gun. We have a troop carrier. We have several versions of anti-aircraft weapon systems. But look what they have in common. They're all built with substantially the same chassis. That was an American innovation. If you were a German weapons designer, you're starting from scratch and you're designing from the ground up just within your silo uh, for each weapon system you want to make. You're not thinking about it in relation to what's the big picture impact on supply chain, on inventory of spare parts, on manufacturing lines, on training uh, maintenance uh, personnel to take care of the equipment after it's gone out into the field. But if you're designing from an American perspective, we're reusing as many parts as we can. That reduces the number of assembly lines. That reduces the amount of assembly tooling that we need to create. That reduces the amount of training for people working in the manufacturing line. That simplifies the inventory of spare parts that we need to 
create to go along with the vehicles when we send them out into the field. That simplifies the training for the personnel fresh out of civilian life that now has to keep the vehicles operating. We had as much in common as possible so that not only did we have the largest manufacturing capacity, but even if we had the same size manufacturing capacity, we were going to get more out of it because of our innovation. The Japanese didn't manufacture this way, the Germans didn't manufacture this way. This was uniquely American. Now we've moved to the tank destroyer section of the combat vehicles rotunda. And I wanna really talk about how we developed our line of tank destroyers and what our starting point was. After World War I, our military leadership made the mistake of thinking that tanks would not be a major factor in future wars. So we didn't really develop a competitive tank. That's why we had a riveted tank with an undersized gun with armor that was too thin. A corollary of that is since we didn't think tanks were going to be a major factor in future combat, we didn't focus on developing tank destroyers. I wanna compare the Battle of France with combat in World War I. So in World War I, we have the Germans fighting against the combined forces of the French and the British. That conflict was a virtual stalemate for years. Deja vu in World War II, we have the Germans fighting against the combined forces of the French and British. That conflict took six weeks. In three days, the Germans' armored force reached the Meuse River, two days faster than the French thought any troops could get through. Well-trained engineer battalions went first. They cleared pathways for the tanks to follow. Then, without wasting a moment, across these bridges, the main armored force of the German military machine rolled through the sedan for the all-important breakthrough into a dismayed and flat-footed France. There went the old ball game for the Allies. From here on, it was only a matter of how long. The Battle of France started in May of 1940. It was over six weeks later, with France completely surrendering and forcing the evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force from the beaches of Dunkirk. Throughout, the Allies had placed their faith not in offense, but in defense. And the defense was doomed to failure because it was confronted with an entirely new technique in warfare, the plane tank infantry team in action. The world was staggered by the speed with which the German armored columns moved. That was the wake-up call to the United States that the fighting, if we entered World War II, was gonna be completely different from the fighting when we entered World War I. We weren't prepared. The only anti-tank gun we had, besides artillery and aircraft, the only infantry anti-tank gun we had was the 37 millimeter towed anti-tank gun. And if you look at it here, you see there's just not much to it. If you think of a German tank and you think of facing it with something this small, you really can get a sense that this is an obsolete weapon. So what we did is we went from having this obsolete 37 millimeter towed anti-tank gun to first buying a little bit of time for ourselves with American ingenuity. We took this towed gun, we mounted it on a three quarter ton Jeep or weapons carrier, and now it's still not a very competitive anti-tank gun, but at least it's self-propelled. We did the same thing with a 75 millimeter howitzer. We had a lot of 75 millimeter towed howitzers. We had a lot of half tracks. We married them together on an improvised basis. And you see here our M375 anti-tank weapon, again, buying us time while we scrambled to design and manufacture a proper anti-tank weapon. By the end of 1942, so a little less than 12 months after Pearl Harbor, we came out with our first purpose-built tank destroyer, the M10 tank destroyer. With the M10, it's got a 75 millimeter gun. If we fired an armor-piercing round and hit the front armor of a German tank at about a thousand yards, our armor-piercing round would bounce off the armor. The armor was thinner 
on a German tank on the side and a lot thinner on the rear. So the idea was we want the tank destroyer to be faster and more maneuverable than a tank with the idea that it then has a possibility of getting in position for a kill shot. The M10 has exactly the same engine as a Sherman tank. So this needs to be more maneuverable. It needs to be faster. The only way to make it faster is to make it weigh less. That's why we took the top off the turret of every tank destroyer. We're taking away a lot of the nice to have features so that we've just got a tank buster gun that has a better chance of getting into position for a kill shot. Less than six months after the introduction of the M10, we upgrade to the M18 Hellcat. You can see some differences in the M18 Hellcat. It's a little hard to tell with the naked eye, but this is actually a, a longer and larger main gun. It's a 76 millimeter high velocity gun. The M18 Hellcat sits a little bit lower than the M10 does. It presents less of a target. That's another little advantage. But the main advantage of the M18 Hellcat was it had a top speed of 55 miles an hour. That was the fastest tracked vehicle on the battlefield during World War II. In fact, the M18 continued to be the fastest tracked vehicle in the U.S. military lineup until the 1980s when uh, the U.S. military introduced the Abrams tank. So this M18 Hellcat was way ahead of its time. It was a speed demon on the battlefield that had a great chance of maneuvering into position to get a kill shot with its 76 millimeter gun. In 1944, about a year after the introduction of the M18, we brought out the M36 Jackson, and now you can see we've made different design trade-offs. The gun on the M36 is quite a bit bigger. That's really the defining characteristic of the M36. This is a 90 millimeter gun. For the first time with the M36, if we fired an armor piercing round out of the M36 at a thousand yards and hit the front armor of the most heavily armored German tank at Tiger II, we had a kill shot. As a trade-off, we lost speed. In order to have a gun that big, the turret needed to be quite a bit larger. That made it all quite a bit heavier. Uh, we added additional armor to the front defenses of the M36 with the idea that we're not going to be fast and maneuverable, but we sure can have a good opportunity to get that first shot off and to take out the German tank just head on. Between the M36 with the 90 millimeter gun and then the Speed Demon M18 Hellcat, we had a very competitive anti-tank lineup. To summarize a little bit, we went from the M37 towed anti-tank gun to the M36 Jackson with the 90 millimeter gun and everything in between in only three years. Just think what a big deal it is to go from a single product to the next product. You've got to do the design. You've got to design the manufacturing process. You have to manufacture manufacturing equipment. You have to manufacture tooling to go into the manufacturing equipment. You have to debug the manufacturing process. You have to scale it up. That's often a year or two for a single product change, not to mention we're going from the riveted tank to multiple versions of Sherman tanks. At the same time we do that, we're creating a global Navy for the very first time with large numbers of ships and many tens of aircraft carriers. At the same time, we're creating a global Air Force fighters and bombers for the first time in American history. At the same time, we're going from a 400,000 person military to a more than a 12 million person military and altogether cumulatively, more than 16 million people were manufacturing uniforms, boots, mess equipment, small arms, training facilities, transportation for all of these troops. At the same time that we're supplying the Soviet Union under our Lend-Lease program, we supplied over 100,000 two and a half ton trucks to the Soviets to help keep them in the fight on the Eastern Front. At the same time that we resupplied the British for all of the equipment that the British Expeditionary Force had to abandon on the beaches of Dunkirk. At the same time, we're creating another 700,000 two and a half ton trucks for the U.S. military. At the same time, we're creating all of the other soft skin vehicles. So this productivity was entirely due to the strength and competitive advantage of the American economy and above all the American manufacturing economy. The good news is, 
we still have the largest economy in the world today. The bad news and the caution is we no longer have the largest manufacturing economy. China does. A person can imagine, and it's a fair question to ask, if we get into a, a nation-state conflict with China anywhere down the road, can we prevail like we did in World War II? Or would they do to us what we did to Germany and Japan? And I don't raise that as an alarmist. It's a point of raising awareness to emphasize the lessons learned in past nation-state conflicts and think about what that means for purposes of American national security and the American ability to defend and protect and maintain our way of life. The essential industries needed to support defense capabilities matter. With the Allied breakthrough, it is no longer a question of reaching the front lines a short distance from the beach. The front lines are far inland and moving fast. The caravans of the Green Diamond, XYZ, White Ball, and others now make supply history. Among the most memorable is the remarkable Red Ball Express. It is organized to supply General Patton's armored columns 400 miles away with urgently needed supplies. Experienced drivers are ready to drive day and night. The trucks will travel a one-way speedway. Only vehicles displaying the Red Ball may pass. Thousands of American lives depend on the success of their supply mission. During the crucial stages of the operation, more than 400 trucks an hour rumble along this route. 7,000 tons of ammunition and hardware are delivered to the front in a single day. The Red Ball Express rolls on around the clock. So here, we're remembering the story of the Red Ball Express. During World War II, the Red Ball Express was famous as a heroic, improvised effort to keep Montgomery's British and Canadian Army and General Bradley's American Army in the fight chasing the Germans, saving Allied lives. If you were a vehicle that was participating in the Red Ball Express, you let everybody know that by putting a red ball on your bumper or somewhere on your truck. That red ball meant the same thing that today sirens and flashing lights mean on an ambulance or a fire truck. You got priority, everybody else moved out of the way. If we had to stop and wait for fuel, if we had to stop and wait for food or for ammunition, that would give the Germans an opportunity to stop, regroup, create a new line of defense, and once we're resupplied, more Americans, more allies were going to be killed in the effort to bring the war to a conclusion. As you walk through the Red Ball Express diorama, one of the striking visuals is the variety of vehicles it takes just to supply frontline troops. It's cargo trucks, it's traffic control, it's radio trucks, it's tow trucks, it's ambulances, it's fuel trucks, it really helps create the impact and appreciation for how many troops it takes to support the frontline combat troops. I think the rough rule of thumb is about 10 support troops for every combat troop. And as you walk through this diorama, it gives you a good start to really visualize why that is. The next big story we remember here in the museum is the story of the Battle of the Bulge. The Battle of the Bulge was important for a lot of reasons. It really proved what was at stake in the Red Ball Express, that it was a matter of life and death on whether we could keep the Germans retreating in disarray and prevent them from having an opportunity to regroup. We've been in combat since June 6, 1944. Now we get into November of 1944. We've hurt the Germans worse than we've been hurt and we need to give our own troops an opportunity to recoup. We broke our own rule. We made the decision to stop, regroup, recharge, and we'll get ready for that last big push across the German border and onto Berlin to end the war. The Germans were far more resilient than we gave them credit for. When we stopped, they regrouped. When we stopped, they brought troops all the way across Europe 
without the Allies detecting it, the Germans massed about 450,000 troops, more than 1,000 tanks, more than 2,000 artillery pieces, what was left of their air force, uh, what was available on fuel and ammunition. On December 16, 1944, the Germans attacked the American army through the Ardennes force across a 100-mile front. At 5.30 a.m. the following morning, flame erupted along an 85-mile front. Hitler's great drive to Antwerp had begun. Initially, we were pushed back. Our being pushed back created the bulge in our line that gave the name to the so-called Battle of the Bulge. What brought the counterattack to an end was a combination of factors. One was Allied defense stiffened. We repositioned our combat troops. The weather cleared eventually. Our Air Force got back into the mix. But the creme de la creme on bringing the Battle of the Bulge to a stop was that the Germans ran out of supplies. The Germans did not have the equivalent of a Red Ball Express to support their counterattack at the Battle of the Bulge. They had only about enough fuel to make it halfway to Antwerp. They were counting on capturing American supply dumps on the way. So they literally, the spearhead ran out of fuel. The spearhead had to abandon their tanks and had to abandon their other motorized vehicles, which made them abandon a number of their artillery and started walking back to Germany. What's particularly remarkable about the Battle of the Bulge is the number of casualties that the Americans suffered in that battle. This was the battle where more Americans were casualties than in any other battle against the Germans during World War II. We lost somewhere between 70 and 100,000 troops killed, wounded, missing in action, or captured. It was the last really big battle between the Allies and the Germans in World War II. There was more fighting, uh, but the, the Battle of the Bulge was the last big battle. So it ended around the end of January. A few months later, April 30th, Hitler committed suicide. Eight days later, Germany surrendered on May 8th, 1945. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. Much remains to be done. The victory won in the West must now be won in the East. The whole world must be cleansed of the evil from which half the world has been freed. The diorama behind me brings to mind any one of a number of different battles in the Pacific theater that comprised the island hopping campaign where the United States took fortified island after fortified island from the Japanese. American policy was unconditional surrender from the Japanese. We were not going to give the Japanese an opportunity to rebuild its military as Germany did after World War I. The Japanese policy was they understood they couldn't defeat us, but they did not want us invading Japan. They did not want us forcing changes to their military, forcing changes to their way of life. The Japanese thought was since they couldn't defeat us militarily, maybe they could break the will of the American people. Maybe they could generate enough casualties that the American people would say, this isn't worth it anymore, and put pressure on the American government to find a way to stop the killing. The Japanese tactics 
had now changed uh, late war versus early war. Early war, like the Battle of Tarawa, the Japanese were still optimistic that they could stop us from successfully creating a beachhead against a determined Japanese defense. Uh, by the second half of 1944, the Japanese realized that there was nothing they could do to stop us from landing successfully, and the Japanese then quit defending the beaches. What the Japanese did was, given their goal of just killing as many Americans as possible, they went inland, they gave up the beach, they went underground. This is the Pacific as you know it. Wide stretches of water. But this is the Pacific as the Joint Chiefs of Staff view it. A battlefield, a vast fortress-studded plain on which key strongholds anchor a Japanese defense line guarding the heart of the homeland. The American front lines had advanced to Guam and Saipan. Ahead now stood Iwo Jima, the most heavily fortified island in the world. Buried deep underground lay 20 years of Jap preparation for murder. 20,000 of their toughest fighting men waited for us to make the first move. And they don't have to wait long. The Navy begins to soften up the island so we can land. We bombard Iwo Jima. Troops are happy out on the troop ship saying nobody could live through that, but in fact, the Japanese were unaffected by the naval and aircraft bombardment. They're waiting for us to come into their killing zones where then they're gonna open fire. They've got uh, their artillery pre-registered, mortars pre-registered, machine guns interlocking firing positions. They had uh, steel doors on their cave entrances. They'd open the door, they'd fire with an artillery piece, they'd pull the artillery piece back, they'd close the door, the counterfire was of no effect, and do it all over again. The fight against the Japanese was very different from the fight against the Germans. If the Germans were in a hopeless situation, they surrendered, and there was honor in surrender. The Japanese were completely different as a culture and as a mindset. The Japanese would not surrender. It was a disgrace to surrender. The Japanese would fight to the finish. In the Battle of Iwo Jima, for example, that was the only battle in the Pacific theater where we lost more troops than the Japanese did. They had 21,000 defenders. There were only about 200 Japanese who surrendered on Iwo Jima. The rest were lost. The Americans suffered casualties of about 26,000 troops. This scenario and these dynamics help explain what the setting was and why on the American side, flamethrowers were so prevalent in our attempting to root out the Japanese. You see all these images of Marine flamethrower teams here in the diorama behind me. We have a depiction of a Marine flamethrower team. Part of our battle plan was we converted Stuart tanks into flamethrower tanks called Satan tanks. We converted Sherman tanks into flamethrower tanks. We converted amphibious tractors into amphibious flamethrowers. And the whole idea was Flame can go into places that can save us from having to send troops into those same places. And in order to try to save as many American lives as we can, we'll burn them alive, or we'll burn up the oxygen and suffocate them, or as was the case in a number of instances in Iwo Jima, we'll cave in the entrance to the uh, tunnel and we'll bury them alive. As we talk about the history of American freedom as we talk about uh, thanking and remembering and honoring service and sacrifice of American veterans. We really remember how brutal, savage, challenging, deadly the war between the United States and Japan was throughout World War II, but especially in these last desperate fights.
We're making just a quick stop in this part of the museum. There's two main messages I want to communicate uh, and then leave the rest of this to you to uh, visit on your own time. The first message is, in this part of the museum, we're acknowledging the role of allies in the uh, success of the United States in World War II. So in the other scenarios, we've had uh, U.S. combat vehicles, we've had some adversary vehicles, but here we've got a collection, kind of a hodgepodge of allied vehicles. This is kind of a storyline where we can say, okay, the Russians were coming from the east, the allies were coming from the west, we met in the middle, we shook hands, we congratulated the people that we'd been fighting with as allies but hadn't seen throughout the war. And it gives us now a little bit of a context for showing this variety of allied vehicles and to share them with those of you who really would like to see other countries' military vehicles. The second message we're conveying in this part of the museum is we're remembering and we're offering a visual on just how much of the physical civilization was destroyed in World War II. So we're depicting that in these images on the walls. Measured in terms of today's dollars, uh, the estimates I've seen are that more than $11 trillion of civilization, physical civilization, was destroyed in World War II. In more recent wars, we've seen some urban destruction. I think of the Battle of Aleppo, I think of the Battle of Ramadi. And there was meaningful destruction, but it was limited parts of civilization. In World War II, we had Aleppos and Ramadis in spades. We had city after city flattened with fire bombs, destroyed by artillery and tank fire, we had city after city, country after country, just an unimaginable level of physical destruction as part of World War II. In order to talk about the end of the war, I'd like to start with the Battle of Okinawa. So the Battle of Okinawa started in April of 1945. It was the last stop in our island hopping campaign. The island of Okinawa itself is only about seven miles wide and 70 miles long. The fighting on Okinawa took place almost entirely on the southern half of the island. It was one of the few island fights where the island was fully inhabited with a civilian population. A lot of the prior battlegrounds were on islands that never had a population. Uh, to an extent, there were islands that had a sparse population or a population that had been partly removed. But on Okinawa, they were all in place being caught in the crossfire. We were now at the other end of the spectrum from where we were in North Africa and in the Battle of Bataan. We had battle-hardened troops. We had combat-proven leadership. We had state-of-the-art weapon systems. We now had complete air superiority. We had complete naval superiority. We had a combination of army and marine units in overwhelming numbers. We had virtually unlimited supplies. The battle started April 1st. 1945, and in spite of all of that advantage, it took us 82 days until June 22nd to defeat the Japanese on Okinawa. In that 82 days, between 250,000 and 300,000 people died. About half of the dead were Japanese civilians. Estimates were, if we lost as many troops on as small a battleground as we had in Okinawa, there was going to be exponential additional losses in the fight for Japan. The Japanese had strengthened its military on its home islands. It had brought troops back from China, it brought troops back from uh, Korea. There were millions of Japanese troops. It was going to be a long and bloody fight, far bloodier than the Battle of Okinawa. We estimated that if the United States lost as many as a million American troops, that the Japanese would lose a multiple of that, maybe 
another three or four million Japanese troops would have died. So there might have been four or five million military deaths. If there were four or five million military deaths, Okinawa taught us that there would be about that many civilian deaths. So maybe as many as eight to 10 million people were going to die in the last battle of World War II. So that was the setting in which President Truman decided to drop an atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima and another atomic bomb on the city of Nagasaki. Those two bombs together killed a little less than 200,000 Japanese civilians in contrast to as many as eight to 10 million lives anticipated to be lost in the invasion of Japan. The second atomic bomb dropped on August 9th. The Emperor of Japan, Emperor Hirohito, made his famous radio address to the Japanese nation on August 15th. He told the Japanese that they were going to do the unimaginable and they were going to endure the unendurable. They were going to stop fighting and they're gonna let the Americans land in Japan. All of that then happened uh, between April 15th and the ultimate signing of the Articles of Armistice on the decks of the USS Missouri on September 2nd, 1945. It is my earnest hope, and indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this solemn occasion, a better world shall emerge out of the blood and carnage of the past, a world founded upon faith and understanding, a world dedicated to the dignity of man and the fulfillment of his most cherished wish for freedom, tolerance, and justice. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. So this brings us now to the last two messages in our interpretation of World War II. The first message is depicted here. We, you see uh, next to me muzzles of three of the 16-inch guns that were actually on the USS Missouri that day in Tokyo Bay, September 2nd, 1945. The second major storyline we offer at the conclusion of our interpretation of the American experience in World War II is the consequences of World War II. And here, there is a lot to tell. First consequence is how many people died? We have a graphic breaking out by country how many people died throughout World War II, more than 76 million. That is estimated to be as much as 4% of the total global population of the time. We don't have the same data on how many people were wounded, but wounded are always many more than the number dead. If 4% of the world population died in World War II, it's a safe conservative estimate to say that at least another 8% of the global population was wounded. Now add to that about $11 trillion of physical destruction of civilization that we talked about with respect to the end of the war against Germany. Add to that the human suffering that isn't captured in a casualty figure like number of refugees, number of homeless, number of orphans. If all of that happened in World War II, one of our big takeaways then was if we had 12% of the global population killed or wounded with atomic bombs entering the war only in the last 30 days, at all costs, we have to avoid World War III. If we have World War III, it's gonna be nuclear war. If we have World War III, instead of 12% of the global population killed or wounded, it may be 12% of the global population that survives. 
Now this shaped our national security, our foreign policy. It shaped so much American behavior in the 75 years uh, since the end of World War II, right through today. This brings us full circle. The whole reason this museum exists is to tell these stories, to make sure that these stories are not forgotten, to make sure that the lessons we've learned the hard way do not have to be learned again by future generations. We're here to honor the service and sacrifice of veterans, of veterans' families, of active military, now and in the future.